I'm not sure, Donna, but we'll go ahead and get the meeting started. So we'll go ahead and call yes. the, the meeting to order. It is 6 o'clock. And this is the uh, City of Desert Hot Springs Public Safety Commission meeting scheduled for today, Thursday, October 14th, 2021. So we'll call the meeting to order. And can I get a roll call, please? Commissioner Eastman? Here. Commissioner Levy? Here. Commissioner Lozano? Over here. Vice Chair Mitchell? Yes. Here. And Chairman Meyer? Present. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Gerald. Uh, we'll go ahead and do the Pledge of Allegiance. Cliff, would you like to lead us in that, please? Thank you. I pledge of allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, one nation. with liberty and justice for all. All right, thanks, Cliff. All righty. Uh, move to approval of the agenda. And, and you know what, Karma Z, I lied to you earlier. We are going to have a couple motions, right? So, and a couple votes. So, I already screwed that up for you. So, but anyway, uh, let's do approval of the agenda. Anybody want to uh, move anything around? Or it's pretty pretty short agenda tonight. So, I don't have a copy of it. Okay. It's just, uh, it's just administrative reports tonight. We don't have any special items on there, Donna. Just the animal okay. control, code compliance, police department, and fire department. So, okay. Okay. So, can I get a motion to? Well, I make uh, a motion. We accept the uh, the minutes. Okay. Can I get a I'll second? Second. Please? It. Second by Donna. All right. Uh, you want to do voting the old-fashioned way, Gerald, or? Yes, since uh, Commissioner Lozano is um, participating remotely, we'll have to do a roll call. Okay, we'll do a roll call vote, please. Okay, Commissioner Eastman. Aye. Commissioner Levy. Commissioner Lozano? Yes. Vice Chair Mitchell? Aye. And Chairman Meyer? Aye. The motion passes. Okay, good. So we're going to move forward with the agenda as is. Uh, hopefully, we, I know we all got the minutes, so uh, review of the minutes from the last meeting, which would have been September 9th. And, and actually, if you click on the little blue line there, the minutes will pop up if you want to look at them real quick. So... And if there's uh, no changes or request to change the minutes, I need a motion to approve the minutes. I'll make that motion. Okay. Motion from Cliff. Second. Second from Ken. Roll call vote, please. Commissioner Eastman? Aye. Commissioner Levy? Aye. Commissioner Lozano? Aye. Vice Chair Mitchell? Aye. And Chairman Meyer? Aye. Motion passes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right, at this time, pursuant to the Brown Act, any person may comment on matters of general interest within the subject matter jurisdiction of the Public Safety Commission not listed on the agenda. Under the Brown Act, the Public Safety Commission should not take action on or discuss matters raised during public comment portion of the agenda uh, that are not listed on the agenda. Comments are limited to three minutes per speaker. Speakers may not yield their time to others without consent of the chair. All comments are to be directed to the Public Safety Commission and shall be devoid of any personal attacks. Members of the public are expected to maintain a professional, courteous decorum during public comments. Please complete and submit a speaker card to the city clerk. You will be asked to state your name and city of residence for the record. I know I've got one blue card, and I'm going to get to you, Ted, in a second. I'm going to see, do we have anybody on Zoom for public comments? Yes, we have one person. Okay, uh, if you don't mind, Ted, I'm going to take the Zoom one first because I would hate to lose that person in the queue if that's all right. <laughs> okay, can we take the, the Zoom public comments first, please? Hello, good evening. My name is Luz Moncada. Can you see me? Hi, Liz. Welcome. Yes. Hi, good evening. Thank you for having me. So mm -hmm. I'm going to um, be speaking to you on behalf of the Coachella Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District. Do you want to just give you a quick update on mosquito control, Desert Hot Springs? Um, so good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Uh, now we have recently seen an increase in mosquito service requests in Desert Hot Springs, and we believe this is due to the invasive species Aedes aegypti. 
gypti, excuse me, spreading to desert hot springs. Now, uh, this species um, has been trapped around the east and northeast areas of desert hot springs. Um, at the moment, this mosquito um, has not had any transmission of uh, viruses in California, but it is capable of transmitting viruses such as dengue, chikungunya, yellow fever, and Zika. Um, Aedes aegypti is a small and black and white mosquito uh, with white stripes. It is an aggressive biter, usually biting in the ankles and elbows, uh, usually during the daytime hours. And it is uh, what we call an urban mosquito. It loves to be around people. Now, um, while we do have dedicated full-time technicians inside uh, assigned to Desert Hot Springs to inspect for sources, um, we want to encourage the public um, to look for water sources and to look around their home now that this mosquito has been discovered in Desert Hot Springs. Um, the most effective way to prevent mosquito breeding with any type of mosquito, but especially this mosquito, is to get rid of any stagnant water. Now, the difference between this mosquito and our native mosquito is that this mosquito um, is able to lay her eggs on the surface of a container. So it's called a container breeder. So it'll stick the eggs on the container and those eggs can be viable for months and up to years until it receives the water it needs to go through the life cycle. Um, the life cycle of a mosquito can take the less than a week depending on the temperature. Um, so it's really important to remove any stagnant water. They don't need a lot of water. A tablespoon or a bottle cap size of water is what they need to be able to go through that life cycle. Most importantly, to prevent mosquito breeding around your home, we recommend you check your lawn drains, um, any debris around your home, uh, check your drains regularly, inspect your uh, yards for any water sources. Potted plants are very popular with this mosquito, especially if you have plant saucers. And also any, um, any type of pictures or pet dishes, we also um, um, recommend if you're outside to prevent mosquito bites using any um, insect repellent that has ingredients approved by the EPA, which are um, a deep picardin oil of lemon eucalyptus and IR35. Other things you can do is repair screens around your home and uh, make sure you wear long sleeves or pants when you're outside. Usually the times that mosquitoes are around are usually dawn and dusk. And with this invasive species, it's in the daytime hours as well. Um, now our district is also offering free virtual or in-person educational presentations for adults as well as children. Um, if um, anybody would like to get in contact with me or um, us, I did send my information over to the clerk of the board. We do offer those for free if you need any um, more information um, or if you want to like it to forward it to a community partner in Desert Hot Springs so we can start the education um, about this mosquito and now that we see mosquitoes more abundant in Desert Hot Springs. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, normally during public comments, we don't ask questions, but I don't know. I mean, did anyone have a question <laughs> for, for, for Luz, reference the mosquito issue? I think we can do I, questions. I did. I have a question. Good. Go ahead, Donna. And, and I'm getting the head nod that, yeah, we're okay to do questions for this one. Yeah, so. Oh, okay. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was very, very good. And... You said it is around potted plants, and how did they get there? <laughs> Just from yeah. outside? I yes, have I have a lot of potted plants, so cactus and whatever in my house. Yes, so um, what we see is that this invasive species most likely traveled from Palm Springs, um, and they don't fly very far, but because we do have vehicles and transportation, we're thinking that's how it got to Desert Hot Springs. Um, now this mosquito is very quickly in reproduction, and so I was saying um, how mosquitoes lay their eggs is usually on the surface of the water, but this mosquito is a different species, so what happens is she will usually um, lay her eggs on the surface of a container. So for example, if it's a potted plant, she will lay her eggs on the surface instead of the water because she's smart. She knows eventually she'll get the water that she needs for her eggs. Um, and so if you do have potted plants, just make sure you're looking out because they're very small. You can't tell their eggs. They maybe look like sand. Um, what you can do is scrub your potted plants for any debris. Make sure there's no standing water, which is what they need. Um, and then you should be okay. Thank you very much. I will do that. Thank you. Okay. Any I, other questions? I actually, oh, I'm sorry, Donna. No, no, that's good. I was just going to say I actually got a mosquito bite the other day. And I thought it was 
I, it, it bit me because of I take Aliquis and it loves my blood. It's <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. So I wondered what the heck it was. I haven't seen any more though, but I it definitely was a mosquito bite. Yes, and now definitely. it's gone. Yeah, check around your home. Um, they, like I said, they don't need very much water. A tablespoon or a bottle cap size of water is all. Uh -huh. So check around your home. Maybe you have some stagnant water, especially um, after a rain these couple of days, um, or if you have some sprinklers, or you just um, sometimes you uh, water your plants. So just make sure you don't have anything just stagnant, um, dumping out your water, scrubbing your plants, and looking around. Okay. I'm sure you might have a source around there. You can always give us a call, and we can go to your home and check to see if you can't find the source. Thank you. And what is your number? My name is uh, Luz Moncada, and then our phone number is going to be 760-342-8287, and we're open Monday through Friday from uh, 7.30 to 4.30. Thank you very much, honey. Okay. Thanks, You're Donna. Welcome. Ken, do you have I'm, something? I'm done. Okay. Ken? <laughs> sure. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, first of all, is there a website available for this information to be disseminated? Do you have yes, a um, yes, we have a website. It's cvmosquito.org. And all the information is on our website um, about 80s and then also about um, our where we tree and all the information about um, our district is on the website as well. Okay. And I'm presuming that there would be a, an image of the mosquito that you're discussing in, in this forum today on the website. Uh, would there yes. also be information pertinent to for uh, symptoms, first aid for a bite or anything like that, and when it would be appropriate after someone received a bite to uh, seek medical attention. Of course, yes. So um, right now, this mosquito Aedes aegypti is not um, hasn't been found in California to have any um, diseases. The ones that we do have in the Coachella Valley, we have three species, and those are um, the Aedes aegypti, but we haven't found any that has virus, and the two different Culex species, um, and those carry West Nile virus and St. Louis encephalitis, mm -hmm. um, which we have had positive cases, um, and those mosquitoes we have trapped in around uh, La Quinta Cove, Thermal, and Mecca. Mm -hmm. um, and all those areas have been already treated and um, warning signs have been gone up. Um, and this started um, usually in mosquito season in July. All right, very well. That concludes my questioning. Thank you very much. Uh, presentation well done. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Cliff? Um, can, do you have a picture of what the mosquito looks like and what are the dimensions? The 80s aegypti, I actually probably do. Let me see, I can maybe share my screen. I can pull up our website. Um, 80s aegypti is a very small black and white mosquito. You can tell um, that it's, uh, the way you can tell if it's that one is by its bite. Um, it's very uh, aggressive and painful and it likes to bite around um, the ankles and elbows um, and our versus our native mosquito, which is brown. Um, so if you see that difference in color or if you get to see it up close, um, that's how you know what it looks like. Um, let me see if I can pull it up on our website and then I'll share my screen really quickly. Yeah, here it is. Okay, so if you're seeing the screen here, this is what we have on our website. It gives you the same information I just gave you. This is what it looks like. Um, it's small, it's black, and it has white stripes. If you do get to see it closely, um, that's what it would look like. Um, and then it just it has more information about sources, what you can do, um, and what we recommend um, as to what you can do towards this mosquito. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Lee? Anything? No. Uh, no? I got that on my phone, by the way. Okay. Yes, we all got that. So, all right. Well, thank you, uh, Liz. We really appreciate it. I, I did notice on the uh, next door neighbor's app or whatever that there was somebody complaining about a lot of mosquitoes up in the north part of the city. So I, I think you guys are right on track with that, so. Yes, so. So we have seen an increase. So we just wanna make sure, um, because in, you know, in history, Desert Hot Springs um, and those areas, we don't see much mosquito activity. Mm -hmm. um, 
but now that we are seeing, we want to make sure that the public knows how to take care of it and um, how to protect themselves as well. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you for coming and spending some time with us, answering our questions. We do appreciate it. Okay? Thank you. Of All course. Right. Thank Thanks. you. Have a good evening. Liz. Okay. You too. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Uh, Ted, you're up. Chair Meyer, commissioners, and city staff, Ted Merhoffen, Denver Hot Springs. I was listening to the uh, your last meeting, and some of you had some questions about the concerned planning. I think one of the, uh, Chairman Meyer was concerned about it. Is the commission looking for fire ladders on the buildings when the uh, plans come before the uh, planning commission? Mm, yes and no. <laughs> we we can look at all that stuff, but basically that is something that you're usually your certified plan checker is also a building inspector. So when they look over those plans and they go out to the job, they, they uh, approve the, the codes and that, that general type of thing according to the plan. So that's basically when that's mostly done. The other thing that came up was a, uh, the building of a fire department with a, uh, a building that would handle a ladder truck. My feeling on buildings that if you can build it today, and build it today because tomorrow it's going to cost you a lot more. As far as is, is it time for a ladder truck, my personal opinion, no, I, I don't think the city's ready for a ladder truck yet, even though some plans have been approved for uh, like the condominiums, I believe you, uh, uh, Vice Chair uh, Mitchell brought up at the last meeting. We're kind of far out. There's only, that was only one project that I'm aware of with the condominiums there, as far as the uh, cultivators go. As you know, and their, their inside planning is a lot different and is not as uh, severe. There was one uh, building that was planned uh, 40 feet up in the air, but it, and that, so that would be four stories, but on the inside, it was actually only gonna be three stories. So there's some things there to, to be looking at it with the fire department and emergency services. We'll have to coordinate later when it does get done. The money for that, Ladder truck, we're not ready for yet. I think uh, Chairman Meyer's idea of uh, getting more emergency uh, response as far as uh, paramedics and EMTs to get to those calls, I think that would be better money spent on that project. But right now, if you can get that building built, build it. The uh, other thing, I, I believe uh, Cliff Lavery, I hope I pronounced that right, said that uh, was concerned about the traffic. And if we're looking at that, yes, I'm, I'm the guy who's really hammering on that. Um, we really need to look at the future growth and how much traffic will be on our streets in the future. Um, I believe that uh, Vice Chair Duffel from the Planning Commission on Facebook sent one of the commissioners a, a video of the traffic situation on uh, Two Bunch Pumps and Little Morongo where the car was trying to make a left-hand turn. And that seems to be some of the uh, traffic problems on Dillon too. Cars making a left-hand turn and people not being patient. So the off street parking down there is uh, something that the city is gonna probably be responsible for. I know that when they first started building, I came there and uh, before the council and said, well, where are they gonna park if we allow all the square footage instead of parking spaces? So that's the things that we're looking at. As far as the traffic, I'm sure the chief can fill you in more on that left-hand turning business and the trouble spots. I'm sure most of you are familiar with them by now anyways. So I just wanted to come. I, I, I do kind of miss the uh, Public Safety Commission after three years. It was a lot, uh, so we say, more relaxed and uh, easier. It's a lot of pressure being a planning commissioner. But um, I know you're not supposed to have any uh, questions, but you have the power if they want to ask questions. The uh, chairman can go ahead and do that if you'd like. Okay. I, no, I, I think we're okay. That was good. I mean, that answered. I, I was wondering, yeah, I was wondering about ladders on buildings and do we have like a code that says to, yeah, put them on there or not? But but I freely admit I don't know anything about fighting fires. So, <laughs> yeah. but go ahead. Yeah, Cliff. I agree, agree with Ted that we don't need uh, the ladder right now, but I think that we should, uh, when we're getting ready to build, that we can uh, should consider that as being in the near future and prepare for it and build with speculation that we'll have one in a few years. 
Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about that in my comments thing. So so I think we're gonna we'll okay. get to that point with that. But no, thank you, Ted. Thank you for your input. We appreciate it. All right, let's go ahead. Any other ones, Karmazi? No, we're good. No, no, we're good. Thank you, okay. Ted. All right, all right. Let's move on with the agenda then. Uh, let's move on to item number one: the Animal Control Monthly Report. Good evening. All right. Well, for the shelter stats, uh, we completed uh, 31 licenses. We had 85 intakes. Zero seized. We took 12 owner surrenders. Seven went out to foster. 18 to rescues. 24 were returned to owner. Uh, we had 13 animals taken to the vet. Four to the county. Two euthanized uh, and 23 DOAs. Uh, we only had one voucher requested in September. Um, and that completes it. Any questions for me? Okay, do we have any questions for animal control? Go ahead, Cliff. Uh, the return to owners, uh, is, is this uh, kind of thing habitual or is it once they've gotten um, returned? Do they usually step up to the plate and take care of the dogs and keep them in? The majority of them do. Uh, we do have some habitual animals that we know by name. Um, we've given them numerous citations, uh, various implementations that we can provide to them to try and contain the animals, but uh, we do have a small percentage that we get in repeatedly. Um, I can give you one example of a dog named California that we've probably had in the shelter ten times in the last six months. Um, and are they fined? Oh yeah, absolutely. Are they paying the fines? Well, that part I I don't have visibility on, but it, the fines are going out to the third party that goes and sends them the bills. So I've not gotten any feedback as far as bills not being paid, uh, but it doesn't seem to curtail their activity. So. Uh, I question whether or not they're paying it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, the majority the, of them do comply. They get their dogs licensed, and, and we don't see them again. Okay. Um, can you next month uh, bring us a, uh, um, what's if they're being paid or if they're not? Absolutely. Can I put that in your report? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Okay. Any other comments, questions? I, uh, I have a question. Hi. Um, are you working with the mosquito patrol here? Every time you get a dog, are they being checked and taken care of before whatever you know happens to them going back home or whatever? Uh, tonight was the first night that I've heard of any issues with the mosquitoes. Um, I mean, we check them over for any other kind of injuries, um, you know, other types of insects like ticks and, and those kind of things, but um, we've not heard of or, or been yeah. exposed to any kind of mosquito problems. Oh, okay. Thank you. I just okay. wondered. Thanks, Donna. Okay, Lee, did you have something? No? I was just going to ask. I didn't. Ever, we have an adoption, right? Do we have a, any dogs or cats adopted? Absolutely. That part of those numbers. Uh, I know you probably said it, but the, I didn't. The foster. Uh, there were seven that went out on foster. That's adoptions. Well, that's that's good. Yeah, that's good. How does that compare across the? I mean, month to month, or week. Um, week to week. Uh, uh, our numbers, I mean, we've got more dogs coming in than are going out. Um, the problem is that all the rescues in the general area are busting at the seams. We're all having the same issue, and that is um, we believe as people are being evicted and or having to move, they're leaving their dogs behind um, or they're just letting them go. We do believe also that people are coming through DHS and dropping off dogs. I have got eyewitness reports of people saying dogs are being pushed out of cars and the cars are taking off. So, um, but we definitely are bringing in two to four dogs a day, and we've got one to two dogs going back out. <laughs> so so it, we're, we're ending up with a surplus. Your business is picking up, which is not good, but that's, Absolutely. that's what's happening. For the, for the number of intakes this month at 85, I looked in the last few months, that's the highest it's been all year. 
Okay, thank you for your time. Yes, sir. Okay. Ken? I have one more question. Okay, hang on one second, Donna. We'll get Ken first. Go, go ahead, Donna. Okay, You're go fine. ahead, Donna. Oh, okay. It's just how many animals do you have capacity for, and how many do you have right now? Well, we have 10 kennels. Um, right now, uh, just before I left, I returned one dog that took us to 17 in-house. Um, so we've got kennels that are double and triple stacked, you know, with dogs that are compatible. So if you go way over, can you bring them to a main animal rescue, like in India or Coachella or wherever it is? Well, we diligently try to. Um, the problem, as I mentioned, is mo many of these rescues are, are waiting for foster placements before they'll even take them in because they don't have any place for them. Oh, wow. Um, okay. I mean, our only pressure relief is the county shelter. And, of course, we have to pay for each dog we send out there. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Ken, go ahead, please. I just had one question. I was noticing the uh, statistics, and there is um, this is the first time I've noticed that there's a um, a bus that performs. I guess it comes over once occasionally and is spaying and neutering and everything like that. I guess there were is the reason they're not including in these statistics where there are no animals that were candidates for its services, or are we not using their services anymore? Or? During the summer, the buses aren't running um, because of the heat, so all summer long they weren't running. So the last time they were actually here was, I believe, in May or June. Uh, they're going to be back here next week. The 22nd and 23rd Animal Action League will be in our parking lot doing spade and neuters and vaccine clinics. Um, the SNP bus has been a little more challenging because they're trying, from what I understand, they're trying to get more money from the city before they'll come back. Hmm. Uh, the last group of them came out of Bakersfield, um, and I believe that was in April. So, But during the summertime, it's too hot on the buses. They can't keep them cool enough, so they won't come. Mm -hmm. Very well. That answers my question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Thank vice you. chair did a good job stalling for me to get back to my seat. So. Did you have another question, Cliff? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, what um, exactly is the, uh, who is, is looking for money, more money from the city? I honestly don't have an answer for you, sir, but I can check into that. Um, prior to um, maybe April, I think May, um, it, it was working somewhere with a SNP bus with somebody above my echelon, so I wasn't part of that conversation. I was just told that they were trying to demand more money in order for them to come in and facilitate their clinics. Um, I mean, really, the only thing we provide is a parking lot and electricity for them, and, and they use our restrooms. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. other than that, I, I don't have an answer for you, sir, but I can check into it. Okay. Um, yeah, and also what uh, what they're looking for in, in far as increases. Okay. Okay. And then, uh, you know, I was just wondering... I, I know that they talked about how during COVID, uh, a lot of people adopted animals. I know because I adopted one, right, during COVID. So, and my wife is very happy. So, and I think the dog is too. But I'm just wondering now that COVID is kind of going down and people are going back to work and now we're all realizing, oh, when I leave the house, I have to leave, leave that little fur ball there. Are you getting a lot of those maybe coming back? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, absolutely, and I, I think that's an absolutely uh, part of the problem is that mm -hmm. folks are, are worried about the dogs tearing up their yard or their house or they're getting out uh, now that they're back mm -hmm. out at work or they didn't realize that this was going to be a full-time job taking care of a dog. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing I was wondering about is, is I mean, uh, you guys over the last two years have just been knocking it out of the park as far as not sending dogs to the county, and obviously... Uh, this month we had four and the prior month we had three which is like 
that's out of control for you guys, and I'm not saying that in a negative way. I understand. I'm just, I'm just wondering, what is there like an underlying cause? I know usually it's because there's dog bites. That's usually why we end up sending a dog. But is it because we're running out of capacity? Or? Yes, sir. I mean, it's, it's to the point to where we literally can't put any more dogs together, mm -hmm. and we have no place other than outside to put them. And during the summer months, as you know, it's just well, way over too hot. Why? Um, right. So that was why the decision was made for some of those dogs to be selected and go over to county okay uh, but no. it is an absolute last resort um, but as I said as we get to a surplus and the, re the rescues are full we, you know we don't have any other resources and, and you know we really don't have room to complain because before we went to this system we were sending 30 40 50 60 dogs a month over to the county so yes, so you guys are still doing a great job I just wanted to see if we could identify what the reason was that we're sending dogs to county yeah, all there's of a sudden, a and that makes couple sense. of them are bite bite wound, you know, bite incidents where they have mm -hmm. to be quarantined, but the majority of them are simply out of space. Out of space. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Cool. All right. Anything else for for Paul? Go ahead, Cliff. Um, what about the? I, I don't see any calls on here for uh, undomesticated animals. Chickens, roosters. Uh, we don't have a stat for it. We kind of put it in other, but we definitely are getting calls for crowing roosters, um, and we're we're trying to nip that, um, you know, get that squall down. Uh, but they've been pretty minimal. Uh, we've had a couple of calls for goats. People, that, you know, decided yeah. they wanted to have goats um, yeah. and things like that. And we work with code compliance and zoning and that kind of thing to, you know, let them know that they can't they can't keep goats in the city. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, next month when you come, can you uh, bring uh, some information as to what um, the basic laws of what can and can't be uh, kept within the city limits? Yes, sir. And uh, And if the public uh, gets a hold of that, maybe that could curtail some of that activity. Okay. Yes, sir. You know, maybe put some flyers around or... Right. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Nothing else? All right. All right. Good questions there. All right, let's move on. We'll move on to item number two, the code compliance monthly report. And I, I do have to say that ever since your presentation on the abandoned buildings, when I drive by them now, I look at them totally different now, so. <laughs> Good evening. So in the month of September, the Code Compliance Division conducted 108 service request inspections and a total of 602 inspections. We issued 47 notices of violation and 23 citations totaling $10,700. Um, I wanted to give you an update on the Sahara Hotel. So we, we spoke, I believe, last month or the month before about um, our actions there. I think everybody knows that the, the hotels had a long list of violations over the last couple of years. Um, we worked very hard and, and received an order to abate the properties to the north. So we were ordered a demolition uh, essentially, it's a standing order for us to get a warrant. Um, we got some bids, and those totaled about approximately half a million dollars. So obviously, that's a lot of money for the city to incur for an abatement. Um, the property owner was willing to work with us and put the properties up for sale. So recently, we were requested to go out and do a tandem inspection with Riverside County Environmental Health, which we did. Um, while we were there, our building official found some egregious violations related to health and safety code, and they went ahead and red tagged the Sahara Hotel. Um, the environmental health department also issued an infraction while we were there. Um, that led us to follow up with uh, some potential buyers who seem to be moving forward with the purchase of the Sahara. They've, uh, they've provided us with a conceptual plan of their rehab and redevelopment of the Sahara, all of the surrounding properties. And so they own that entire city block. 
So that's looking very promising. The city has issued demands for payment, so any outstanding fines will be paid first. They'll enter into a buyer's agreement with us, and then we will move forward and give them the appropriate amount of time so that they meet the milestones for compliance. So it's a good update on that. Um, I did want to piggyback on the presentation from Vector Control and just let you guys know that code enforcement works year-round with Vector Control. Um, so anytime that there's reports of stagnant water, we respond to those. Um, we will call out vector control when necessary and they will treat water for us. They will treat stagnant pools. They'll treat abandoned properties with any sort of stagnant water. We also, I believe last year or the year before, entered into an indemnity agreement with the vector control so that if we need to use their services, they have a standing warrant in the Coachella Valley that we can enter the premises and abate water as necessary to mitigate mosquitoes. So I just wanted to give you an update on that. Um, and then also I know there's a little bit of talk, and this is kind of outside the purview of, of code enforcement, but I oversee cannabis enforcement obviously too, and I'm very active in the cannabis facilities, and I know there's been a lot of talk about the parking issues along Two Bunch. Um, so the city is aware of them. We've been working for a few months now to try to mitigate the issues with the parking. So we're looking for some temporary solutions that would include um, possibly parking on vacant land. Um, we would have to obviously glue those, those lots and make sure that there's dust control mitigation measures in place. So we're looking for some temporary solutions. We're also looking for some very permanent solutions that would include parking structures um, and also, you know, repavement, restriping and different various, you know, public works solutions long term. So that concludes my report. Okay. All right. Do we have any uh, questions for Christina? Well, I just have a comment. Go ahead, Don. I remember, you remember that I was complaining about the odor coming on Two Bunch Palms, how strong it was. And I don't know what you did, but it has gone down tremendously. And I don't know if I should thank you or... <laughs> So actually, when I left the meeting, it was funny because I got another report of it. And so uh, my team immediately followed up and, and did an inspection. And what we found is that we believe it's from an illegal operator and not our legal operators. So we you know, contacted the necessary oh. departments, and I don't know that anything's happened yet, but we have noticed that it's been mitigated as well. Uh, I don't believe it's coming from any legal operators is all that I will say. Oh, Okay. Well, it, whatever, it works. <laughs> it's working. Yeah. How do they? How do illegal operators? Where do they operate? I mean, everywhere, in single-family residences and apartment complexes and vacant oh. lots everywhere. Oh, I'm so naive to this. <laughs> okay, I I understand. Thank you. Mm -hmm. At least you're aware, and something's being you know, looked at all the time. So I'm happy with that. I've even pulled grows out of underground chambers in Anza. So that was, <laughs> that was always interesting going into tunnels. So, all right, anybody else for Christina? Cliff, please. Uh, when you're baiting pools, what's the procedure for that? Typically draining the water. And then okay. if there's any sort of, um, we'll call vector control first. What they usually do is release um, their fish of some sort, little fish that'll eat the algae and obviously try to try and mitigate it that way before we actually have to do any sort of abatement. If that doesn't work or if it remains stagnant for an excessive amount of time, then we will go in, drain the pool and clean any any you know algae any green stagnant materials and then are they property owners built for that absolutely okay um another thing that i uh, have for you christine is um i noticed um because of a recent disagreement that uh there's some parking issues on two bunch of palms and the first i believe road to the left or to well which would be the south side uh off of two bunch heading west that, that's the one i'm talking about okay um also the ones that are along two bunch of palm two bunch of palms uh did they collect um uh improvement 
money for gerbs and cutters, uh, gutters? Yeah, the, the majority of them have, and the majority of them have completed their street improvements. That particular project that you're talking about, um, I know that they're, they submitted an application last year and it was underway. I believe that it's been completed. Um, the facility immediately north of that has completed that. The only facility that has not is at the corner and in that respective area that I know of is the one that's at the corner of Little Morongo and Two Bunch Palms on the south side. So that facility currently has an active code enforcement case for those street improvements. Okay, so the one that they're currently, because there's a lot of traffic over there, I know a lot of it's construction, but um, it that, that should have been started uh, before they got so far in completion of the building. Yeah, a, a lot of the facilities that we brought online in the very first phases of, you know, permitting cannabis facilities, specifically cultivation facilities, because there was such a, an enormous cost associated with these people coming online and none of us really understood what that framework would look like, both you know on, on our side or their side. What we did was we essentially allowed people to operate under temporary certificates of occupancy, which meant that their conditions of their CUP, not all of them had been met. The majority of them had not been met. Most of those fees were significant. So most of that included street improvements, um, landscaping, all of those things. That's why you saw all of the cultivation sort of build out and start, but they looked very bare bones. So what we did is we provided an expiration date for their regulatory permits, for their conditional use permits. It said, at these days, you need to have X, Y, and Z of your conditions completed. So for the facilities that did not fulfill that, we opened cases, we have issued citations. Most of them have complied. There's only a very few that have not okay okay is it in the plans now that those have to be completed before yes, construction sir. begins yes, sir. <laughs> okay. yeah we don't make those exceptions anymore everybody kind of knows the program and and we ensure that all of their conditions are met and, and we don't even really issue temporary certificates of occupancy any longer unless you know there's something outside of their control a good example of that would be the cannabis business parks so operators that are inside of the business parks if they plan to have four phases of construction and they're in phase two we understand that they're obviously not going to put in landscape while there's active construction things like that right yeah okay um uh commissioner meyerhofer uh had called me uh earlier in the month or maybe even last month and voiced his concern about the parking that was on there and i drove down there and looked really scouted all the way down to dillon and then up even to the uh, industrial park there on Indian uh, North. And uh, I did see that there was some uh, parking that's going on outside in the street for employees, it seems to me. Um, and I would wondering why they're not parking on the uh, premises in the parking uh, provided. So it, honestly, it's just that that particular facility has outgrown its space. It has outgrown its space by about 50% already, um, and they're looking to put in more. So you see those module buildings? Mm -hmm. They had to actually move their employees into those buildings just so that they could continue their operation. And that came with a, just a, a laundry list of things. They needed to submit uh, new development permits. Um, they want to expand permanently, so they'd like to build another building. Um, that required, obviously, environmental reviews and all of these things. So unfortunately their business is just growing faster than they can accommodate and so as a temporary solution that's where they're parking because the only other place they could park is along two bunch palms and that just would not be safe so we have asked that they park along cabot road versus parking on two bunch palms and risking their employees crossing that very you know well i see a lot of that going on there too yeah they, they should not be doing that everybody should be parked along cabot for the time being and like i said we're trying to figure out a temporary solution for them to park in a lot down the street so that they're off of the actual street okay 
Um, we, we understand, trust me, about how, uh, yeah, it, we're very concerned about the parking as well, and, and not just, you know, because of this one particular facility, but for all the facilities moving forward. Um, Steve, is that something we could do, is do some patrol along there and put some courtesy notices that um, the parking, that um, yeah, that's not, curbs? Yeah, that's not a problem. Let's officers go by there. Okay. Thank you. Anything else, sir, Christina? No? I, I just had a couple of things real quick. Uh, is is one, you know, it, it's so sad to hear that about the Sahara, because, I mean, uh, if you ever get the chance, go on YouTube and look up Jeff Bowman's history of the spas here in the city. He does a great job. Je uh, Jeff's a former uh, commissioner on the Public Safety Commission, and he helped teach me how to do this. And then he's also he's also been a, a board member of the Mission Springs Water District, but he does a great lecture on the and he mentions the Sahara in there, and it's and it's so so gosh that would be terrific if you could work that out to to bring that back. I mean, plus we need the TOT, so uh, yeah, you got to look at the money side of it too. But yeah, that would be terrific if you could bring that back. I did notice at the Hyundai though that the number of cars are not getting less <laughs> parked in the parking lot; they're getting more, and I'm hoping those are maybe workers. <laughs> But and I, the fence is kind of taking a few hits, and so I'm wondering if we're if, if there's an update on that, then maybe we're we're getting closer, or some or some good news with it at least, maybe. If you want to address that, I'll leave it up to figure out who wants to talk about it. I, yeah, I will talk yeah. about. Okay, I'll talk about it. Are you ready for mine? Because I'm going to include that in my report. Well, I, I, can just, I can just give you the info on that. Well, so. you know what? If, are, are we done? Everyone's done with uh, Christina's portion? Yeah, I think so. All right, then, then the Chief's made a great suggestion, so let's go ahead and move to item number three, the police department report. Yeah. Thanks, Chief. And, and I'll start with the, the Honda. As, as you know, uh, that's been red tagged. Um, in fact, the Chief and I were just there today. We're getting real close to actually just us going in there and removing the last few people that are in there. Um, the majority, the vast majority of people that are in there now are folks that are coming in daily and just trespassing. Um, there is, I know, one family, unfortunately, that's still in there with, with uh, six or seven children. Um, the good part is we've, we've offered them a lot of resources to get them out of there. Unfortunately, they have not accepted those resources. Uh, but we are, we are at a point, and coming very soon in the next week or so, um, we will be going in there, um, and the last of the people will be removed there. So um, the owner has gone through and started taking doors off of the, uh, the units in an effort to keep folks from going inside the units. Um, but again, we still have uh, a transient population that is daily or during the evening um, cutting the fence and going through the fence uh, and entering those rooms illegally. So... Uh, like I said, there is a plan currently in place to address that, and we should see some, some relief there in the next week or so. And are they going to have any patrol One, because the, the fences have been just knocked down? And yeah, so the plan is obviously on, on the police department side. Our officers have been doing an, a, a, a lot of extra patrol through there. Uh, what the plan is, once those last folks are removed out of the facility, the fences will be redone and then a private uh, the plan is for a private security firm to come in uh, and maintain the security within that property okay yeah i uh which hotel is this that's the hyundai all oh, right okay sorry i have uh, coffee at a.m. p.m. every morning and there's a gentleman that comes there as well and he said that he was still living there and that they had offered him a voucher for a hotel room for one night and is is that do you know of any cases like that 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 we have offered we we have had services go in there and offer to help set up with uh, alternate housing for for everybody that had been in there living uh, in there and paying okay. in there um, but again now we're at a point where those that are left uh, are just not accepting that that help to get out of there okay. um, the owners are are not supposed to be collecting any any additional monies for rent inside there. Um, so we're still trying to work with the owners. Um, they've been unfortunately not 100% not helpful in this. Uh, they haven't from the beginning. Yeah, yeah, but we continue to, to try and work with them uh, on that. Uh, but like I said, we are, we are at a point now where it's gotten to where uh, if folks aren't gonna accept help and services, um, those that are left, unfortunately, uh, it's red tagged. It's not a safe place to live at all, to be in. 
um, that now for their own safety we will have to remove them. Yeah, I re remember um, a debate several years ago that was uh, held there when J.R. was uh, running for mayor and the pl I didn't trust when to attend the debate and I didn't trust the floors and the s stairs and things. I mean, they were caving in back then. So. Yeah, yeah. walk them through there, tell you on the second floor. I, I tell you, it's, it's, it's a bit nervous. It, I wouldn't do you it. You can though. fill it, yeah, you can fill it underneath you, so. Thank you. Yes. Um, and then I'll continue on. So I know you have this, the crime stats uh, for the month of September. I'm just going to touch on a couple of them. Unfortunately, we did have one homicide in the month of September. So that's three for the year. I do want to make a note on the homicide that we did have in September is that our detectives uh, were able to make an arrest on that case within 24 hours. So they did some fantastic job. Uh, the case was one that, that really was a, a whodunit. Uh, basically, an individual that had been shot was dropped off in front of the police department. Uh, that individual at the time was still talking, uh, but refused to give any information on what happened. And unfortunately, he passed away a short time later. Uh, but again, the detectives uh, were either to gather information, and within 24 hours, they did make an arrest, a subject. Um, we believe he was making his way towards Mexico. Uh, they found him down in the Fallbrook area, northern San Diego area, and made that arrest. Um, burglaries, we've seen this is our third month of decrease in burglaries, so that's a good sign. We had six for the month of September. Unfortunately, motor vehicle theft, we saw an increase in the month of September of 22. I looked at those mm -hmm. cases, those 22 cases, um, and there's not, there's not one particular pattern that would indicate uh, a ring out there targeting specific vehicles. Uh, these 22 are every assortment of vehicle that you can imagine. Um, a large percentage of that, about 20% of those, were vehicles with the keys left in them. We've talked about this before. Um, about 20% of those vehicles were ones that were just keys left in car running and stuff. So, again, we've talked about it before. It continues to happen. The best way to protect your property is, is not to, to leave it a, an easy mark for folks. Um, and then uh, weapons violations. Uh, the officers have been making a lot of proactive traffic stops and been getting a lot of guns off the streets. You've probably seen in the news. Um, throughout the nation, these ghost guns um, that are out there, um, we've seen several within the city, but the officers are making these stops and getting a lot of these guns off the streets before they're, they're involved in some um, violent crime, so they're doing a great job with that. For the month of September, uh, we had a total of 2,757 calls for service. Uh, 1,581 of those calls were were calls for service and 11, uh, 1,182 of those were officer initiated calls. So those are traffic stops and, and vehicle checks and pedestrian checks. But officers made 258 traffic stops for the month of September. They conducted 463 building checks. They conducted 166 vehicle checks and 289 pedestrian checks. Um, and so they're out there, they're being very proactive in, in the work that they're doing in addition to handling all those radio calls that come their way. For the budget, we are finishing up, or just past the first quarter. Um, the police department at the end of the first quarter is at 24% of the budget, so we're right on, right on target of where we want to be. Code enforcement was also at 24%, so right on target. And animal control coming in at 21%. So for that first quarter, you have the 21-22 uh, the uh, budget, we're, we're right where we want to be. Some other things going on. Um, new construction has started in the lobby of the police department. Um, so what's being done there is just a facelift on the inside there. Um, if you haven't been in there for a while, when you walk in, um, there, there's a, a counter area and there was a plexiglass, basically what it was. And so we're changing that out to something a little more secure. Uh, because we do keep our lobby open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It never closes. Yeah. So uh, something a little bit more secure for, for the employees that are working, especially during the evening time uh, in that area. So that started. A couple of little delays in that, but it's moving forward, and hopefully soon uh, I'll be able to bring back some new pictures for you of, of the lobby that's going on. I'm happy to say it's been a while since we talked about it, but I know we mentioned it. We ordered some new vehicles for the police department fleet uh, probably eight or nine months ago. They have finally started to come in. 
uh, getting some relief there. So patrol is getting some new vehicles as well as uh, detectives and the admin staff. So these are much needed vehicles. Uh, the fleet is an aging fleet. As you know, these cars, they run 24-7. Um, so it takes a lot to keep them maintained. Um, so these are a great addition to the fleet and, and helping out the officers quite a bit. Uh, in terms of um, traffic enforcement, as mentioned before, uh, we did get this, the radar, radar speed trailer uh, back working, and that has been placed back out throughout the city. Uh, in addition, to, we did get a ghost vehicle, police vehicle, that has been placed out in the city, so you may see it. Uh, I don't want to give it the exact locations of where it's always going to be at, so folks don't know if it, which vehicle it is, but it's out there, uh, and we are utilizing that as part of our educational uh, and enforcement tool for traffic enforcement throughout the city. Thank you very much for that. That's Absolutely. been a call of mind for quite a while. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, in addition, in terms of traffic control, um, our OTS grant uh, started again October 1st. Um, so we have a lot of OTS, Office of Traffic Safety details going out, a lot of specific details, traffic enforcement, traffic education, um, DUI saturation patrols. Um, so a lot of those are, are taking place. Uh, we're back doing those. Those are uh, uh, paid for by the state. They're overtime assignments for officers, but allows us to uh, not to have to pull someone from patrol, but to add extra folks out on the street uh, and specifically target uh, those areas where we're seeing a lot of traffic violations, particularly along Palm Avenue in the safety corridor area. Um, next week, October 19th, our third community service officer will be starting. So uh, our goal is to get three community service officers. Uh, so this will have us reaching that goal. Uh, so we're very excited to have this third person come on board uh, and assist not only in calls, but the officers with prisoner transports in a wide variety of functions, uh, both out in the field and inside the office with records division and stuff. So it's going to be a great, great help uh, to the staff and the officers of the police department. Um, and then last thing I talk about is I think probably everybody, we had an incident at, uh, at the high school yesterday. Um, we've had several at the high school since school started again. So um, just, just some information real quick on the incident yesterday. There was a fight yesterday afternoon at the high school. I know a video that was taken um, um, by students that witnessed the fight. Uh, it went out on social media. Um, we did receive the police department. We did receive a call about the fight and responded to that. Um, but one of the concerning parts of that video is that at one point, one of the individuals, a student that was involved in that fight, um, breaks away from the fight and goes towards uh, what appears to be his backpack that was on the ground and attempts to open up the backpack as if he's retrieving something. Um, our concern, obviously, is that we don't, we don't know what he was trying to retrieve from there because before he was able to do that, um, some other students grabbed the backpack and the backpack disappeared. They ran off with it. Um, Again, our concern is that the only reason that while involved in a fight that he's trying to get into his backpack is that there was potentially some sort of weapon inside there. Um, so it's caused a lot of concern, and rightly so, uh, to the school, to the police department, to the parents and the students that are there. Um, so we have had extra patrol uh, at the school since that incident yesterday. We've had detectives on campus all day today. They will be there tomorrow also. Uh, just doing outreach with the students, uh, letting themselves be, be seen talking to the students and letting folks know that, that we are there uh, to make it a safe environment. Um, on Monday evening at 6 o'clock at City Hall, there will be a town hall meeting uh, where we're asking parents to come and voice their concerns, uh, pros and cons, uh, uh, what they think is going on, what they like to see going on. Um, the school has been invited to that meeting also. Uh, we had a meeting with the school today. We are working very co collaboratively with the school. Um, their concerns are the same concerns that, are, that we have, is, is providing a safe campus for the students and a safe learning environment. So um, that will be Monday evening at 6 p.m. at City Hall for anybody that can make it. And then also um, next week on Tuesday, uh, the SRO contract will be, will be before City Council. Um, um, Palm Springs Unified did pass the SRO contract, MOU. Uh, on their end, uh, we will be giving it to City Council on Tuesday. I don't anticipate any issues with that. Uh, we do have, um, we have selected an officer from Desert Hot Springs to be the school resource officer at Desert, uh, Desert Hot Springs. Um, that officer will be going through training actually starting next week. There's, there's two different classes that that officer is scheduled to attend and that will start next week. Uh, so all goes well and again, I don't anticipate any problems. Uh, by the end of the month, first, first part of November, 
uh, we are hoping to see uh, an SRO back on campus there, so that'll be a great resource added there. Uh, but again, that'll be that'll be discussed at City Council on Tuesday. Um, and that completes my report. But I'm available for any questions if you have any. Okay, questions for the chief. I yeah. actually have one. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Donna. Chief, I'm wondering, are all the lights that we're going to be put into, say, like on Palm Drive, are they all done? Because yes. <laughs> you drive up Palm Drive and there's still these dark spots that people just have to walk across the street and you can't see quickly. Yeah, you know? so, so everything in the safety corridor uh, has been completed. Uh, unless, of course, a light had gone out or something like that, we had checked, but, but otherwise everything has been completed in that. Certainly as you go Palm, especially as you go south on Palm, it gets a lot, uh, gets a lot darker uh, for the lighting on there. But within the safety quarter, that has been completed. Huh. I think there's supposed to be some, some work on Pearson, too, if I recall. There is, and I know there's also some improvements that are being worked on in Pearson, so uh, yeah. that city council or the staff is working on. Yeah. Can we have a night patrol where when, and that just goes up and down the streets and hands out neon tape, put it on their shirts, <laughs> so if they cross the street, we see them? <laughs> that is not a bad idea. We do have, just so you know, we do have, when I talked about the traffic enforcement, the, the OTS details, we do have, it is mixed up between day and night, so we are putting them out there at night also, and they're out there till midnight to 2 o'clock in the morning, so. Yeah, okay. I mean, I know, I mean, people just want to get across the street, but they don't know. I don't know if they know or care they're putting themselves in such danger. We can't, you know, see everything yeah, either. It's, you it's know, we look for cars. It's definitely the education part of it. And again, a lot of, a lot of times we think it's common sense type stuff, uh, but it is yeah. cr cross at the crosswalk, use the signals, cross in lighted areas. Uh, when you're when you're especially at night when you're trying to cross and you're, and you're not utilizing those safety features um, headlights you can't really judge how fast they're coming at you it may look like it's a distance away um, but it's deceiving and you start to cross and you're putting yourself in, in great jeopardy right. uh, when you do that right are we doing okay. any jaywalking citations we are we are and especially um, in the morning as uh, the kids are going to school We've had officers out there, um, not only for the pedestrians, but for the vehicles also that are driving. So um, is it coming at not only upon the, the drivers, but you know, like we were just talking about the deer walking, the pedestrians also have rules that they have to follow um, as well, and they can be cited for violations. Um, and the OTS grant, what are we looking for this year? Um, what we have from the OTS is we have uh, enough to put details out for, again, DUI saturation patrols and DUI fixed um, checkpoints, as well as specific traffic uh, enforcement details. And those cover usually uh, pedestrian details, motorcycle details, and then basically some of the, the major violations such as speeds and that type of thing. So those details will be going out monthly uh, for the next year that goes October 1st to October 1st. Um, and then they also, detail also provides us to send officers um, for standardized field training, um, coordination training, so DUI training, uh, we get them to go to that. Um, drug recognition experts, it provides training so that we can send officers to that. Um, and they also in this, this um, current OTS um, contract, we were able to um, purchase a new DUI trailer. So we've actually uh, just ordered that. It'll take a few months before we get that, uh, but we will be having a new DUI trailer uh, to assist us at all those details. Okay, and what does the grant come in for that? For all of that? Um, the grant, it, it's close to $90,000 that we're getting for this grant, and, and that is money that we do not have to pay back. Um, for like the DUI trailer, that type of stuff, we pay up front and then we get reimbursed. We submit our receipts and we get reimbursed for that. Okay. There are specific things that we have to, to complete for the reimbursement, but we just make sure we, we check all those boxes so we get full reimbursement for those. Cool. Thank you. Uh, one other, uh, sorry, um, I missed it. Uh, I was planning on attending your community meeting at the church. Can mm -hmm. you give us a little update on how that went? 
Yeah, it was it was a great event. There wasn't a huge crowd there. Um, I think we had 15 to 20 folks there at that event. Um, we really didn't have a real specific agenda other than just let folks know what's going on with the police department, what's going on within the city, and then we really left it open um, 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 for the audience to ask us questions. Um, uh, but myself, obviously, Chief Henson was there, uh, and Commander Lindsay was there. So uh, I, I think we probably went for close to an hour and a half. Uh, okay. So so it, was, it, it appeared to be very, very well received, um, and we were able to just spread a lot of information about uh, what's going on and get some feedback on, on what the community would like us to see doing a little bit more or a little bit better. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Ken, you want to go? Sure. Well, first a comment. Um, kudos to yourself and the law enforcement community. We uh, noticed the, uh, my wife and I noticed the increased law enforcement presence on our local streets and roads on Columbus Day, you know, on that day. And uh, that's been one of, well, you know, one of my wishes was for greater traffic enforcement within the city limits. It's always been, you know, I wonder if sometimes if I'm going to be, as long as I'm not falling to fault in an accident, anything else that happens is okay. You know, I don't care if they strap me, helicopter me, or whatever, as long as I'm not at fault. But I'm very grateful to see the increased traffic enforcement. So thank you for that. Um, the question would be, uh, I was wondering why the school resource officers were not in place within uh, our schools contemporaneous with the beginning of the school year. And since we're using our resources essentially to take to handle what I believe is a, um, a Palm Springs Unified School District responsibility. Are we going to be submitting a bill for service to the school district so that we can uh, reimburse the cost of essentially doing their job for them? Yeah, I, I will tell you that that is a conversation that we've certainly had. Um, the reason initially they were not put in is uh, the Palm Springs Unified School District. They're basically revamping their school resource officer program uh, and at the beginning of the school year, they weren't they weren't ready uh, based on some some additions they wanted to do in terms of training and how they wanted that program to look. So so there was that delay. Um, um, we thought about that, but uh, the better course of action we had was just working closely with them, uh, working through those issues, uh, which um, we have done, uh, and get it up and running as soon as possible. Um, so yeah, it took a little longer than anticipated, I think, on, on all ends, uh, but we're, we're at that finish line there to see that happen. Okay, great, thank you. How many officers are they going to be supplying? We will be supplying one for the high school. Uh -huh. uh, that officer will uh, also assist at the middle school as needed, and then we're looking at two part-time officers uh, not supplied by Palm Springs Unified. These are just officers that we will have as a collateral duty to assist at the middle school. Do we have a lot of issues at the middle school? No, the middle school is more uh, stopping issues before they happen, and it's more that community outreach and, and that education with the students. We don't have the, we don't have the issues at all there, uh, but looking at what's been going on in the high school and, and the history, uh, we want to try and, and, and get get the youth a little bit younger um, and, and be there, and so they know who we are and, and we know who they are, and just get that education out earlier. Um, also, maybe a precursor to the um, program that they have at the high school with public safety, because um, I know some of the younger kids are interested in starting like a, a precursor to the high school uh, classes. Yeah, uh, exactly, and that's what our outreach at the middle school will be. And they do have a public safety uh, campus classes at the high school. Uh, just talking to the assistant principal today. It's very well attended um, and going well. Uh, but yeah, we'll be reaching out to the, to the younger ones even before then, uh, hopefully to at least spark their interest maybe uh, in a career of either law enforcement or just public service or just a knowledge of what's going on. And, and again, we're back, back to the basics of right and wrong of what's going on in your community. Yeah. I know um, when I was commissioner before, um, Eric Huber was uh, teaching the classes and things and he did an absolutely mm -hmm. wonderful job I would they invited me to their awards program and they invited me to some of their classes to join them and see what was going on and I really enjoyed it so yeah it's a good program in fact I uh, one of my 
uh, tenants um, sons wanted to go into that but he wasn't old enough to go into the uh, high school program yet he was still in junior high but he was really interested you know can I go and look at watch the class or you know sit in or certainly so yeah it's very yeah. very worthwhile uh, program yeah thank you okay we I don't have much but uh, uh, the, on the uh, the ghost car you know, I've been bugging you about that, so I'm glad to see it out there. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, my question is, uh, are you going to rotate it around? We are, and that's why I didn't specifically give, tell you where we're, we're having it at, not because I know it's an issue for you guys, but this is, a public, this, is a, this is a public hearing, uh, so we want to keep folks on their toe, but it is it's, moved around. Yeah. It, uh, is this a is, is this a, a permanent thing? You're going to do that, or you're going to, is this just a trying it out, or how? No, it's a permanent. We're hoping we're because I think it's keep that going. I yeah. think it does work. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, we had and it moving week. around is the best thing to do, and uh, it, I'm glad it's out there. And another question I have: I noticed that uh, uh, I guess Little Morongo and Pearson they have the stop signs, have the lights around them now. They're light. Yes. And uh, well, uh, Two Bunch Palms and uh, Little Morongo would be an out that standing at four way stop right there. That would be beautiful to have the same kind of thing right there. And I believe that location is being looked at. I can double check on that. It really looks good. That's, if they, if yeah. that's, a, that's a bad place there. If you were, well, you weren't here then, but we had a motorcycle uh, accident, a death there in that section. That's why we got a four way stop. But you can't see the sign until you really got to get up on top of it at night. And those lights around there really make a big yeah. difference. Yeah, they're excellent. And that's so that'd be a good safety. place to try to work and see if we can get something in there. Yes. I know there's a million things out there for you to do. But uh, some, and, uh, during our conversation here, uh, I think it was Donna brought it up, but they were talking about people getting hit, hit in the street on, on Palm Drive and the right. pedestrians getting run over and all this kind of stuff. Uh, today, coming up here, I, uh, I stopped for a pedestrian, and he wasn't quite at the intersection, but he was close to it. But he was standing about two feet on, in the street, and I stopped, and everything else just kept right on going. And I stopped, and the guy waved at me to go, to go, and I said, no, you go. So he walked across, but other cars just kept right on going. So the problem is, it's, it, I know it's the pedestrians is the problem, but these people are driving. That's, these, right. I, I don't know how we can educate the, 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 the people that are driving these cars, but that's the law that they have to understand. That they have to stop. I don't care if it's at a crosswalk or where it's at. If there is somebody walking across that street, they've got to let them, let them go. They've got to stop. And it kind of upset me when I saw that because I see it a lot. And I know it's, uh, I'm just kind of bloviating here a little bit, but it's it really a bad situation and we know it. So how do we stop it? I don't know. But uh, it's just a matter of, uh, hopefully there's an officer around when it happens, but I know you can't be everywhere. I, I know that for, I've been there and it's, it's kind of hard, but when I, I just couldn't believe that happened. I mean, I was sitting there and it got, the car just kept zooming by and I, kept, I, I couldn't believe it. And it's not. It's happened to me many times, many times. But anyway, you guys, are you guys going to look, look into this, making those stop signs with lights around them? Is that something that's? Yeah, I, I know the one there that you were talking about was new, and, and it's been very successful. And Beautiful. It, it's an, yeah. a great extra safety feature on those, so and, especially uh, in those I dark mean, areas. I've seen them. Other cities have them, and it's a, it's really a great, a great thing. And that's a bad intersection because I drive by there a lot. I go through there, and uh, the when, nighttime, terrible. But uh, you guys are doing a good job, excellent. That part I like. So, uh, the, oh, you can do so much, and uh, so that. And you mentioned that ninety-seven thousand dollars. Has that money been spent already on something? You said uh, it, it. It'll be throughout the year. So that reimburses those overtime details for the extra traffic enforcement uh, and those DUI details uh, that that grant does. So throughout the year. Um, we'll be doing that and putting in the in the uh, that's, submissions. It's, it's going right at traffic yeah. enforcement. That's where it's at. Yes. And how's the motor officer thing going? The motor officer thing is going fantastic. Um, <laughs> so we've got, uh, as I mentioned before, I know, you know you're we have it. two. I, I have been on the bike quite a bit right. over the last few weeks and stuff, just because one of our officers is still out. Uh, so I've been trying to pick up the slack a little bit for him. So so we're still doing that. Uh, and yeah, you know the safety corridor. Uh, you know, the city did a lot of redesign and spent a lot of money on that and did a really nice job on that. Um, we focused a lot of our enforcement efforts in that. 
Um, so it's a combination, uh, you know, it's a combination of roadway design and enforcement and then education and then a lot of it comes down to personal choices that people that make. Well, I, I, I do see more officers out there. So I see a CHP a lot out south. They're, they seem to be working out pretty good through there too. So They, they do, they, and we do d details with them because part of that area does yeah. belong to them, but they'll come into the city and assist us. Yeah. Um, so, so we are doing a lot of enforcement out there. So, anybody listening, be known that we are out there. We're I doing enforcement. See it all every day. Uh, and normal. if we catch you, you're going to get a ticket, and they're not they're not cheap. Uh, those tickets are extremely expensive, and then they hit you on your insurance also. Um, yeah. So, but we're not letting folks get away with it. Um, and so, if they're out there doing it, we're going to catch them. Oh, good. That's uh, that's all I've got. But you guys keep working at it. How many? Uh, by the way, how many officers are are we up to? How many people do we have out? So, so we're still looking for about three officers. So yeah. we, we have a few going through the background mm -hmm. process right now. So uh, fingers crossed that, that they make it through. Uh, but we're looking for three more officers still. Do we have any more officers out IOD for some reason? Uh, we, have, we, have, we have one long term out. And then our motor, other motor officer uh, is out. And hopefully he'll be back soon. We did have just a couple that returned. Uh, back to full duty so so we're doing good as far as getting folks back uh, that were out on that yeah i was going to ask you about uh i saw your list that the motor 20 22 motor thefts so you explained that uh that this is a combination of little bit of everything but that was a big jump yeah big jump that and that's I figured the first the big jump that we've weapons seen weapons was so. i guess you went out and worked that pretty good yeah you must have made a special was that kind of a detail or something going looking for guns? You know what? It was it, that was the, just the officers going out there and really doing some really good practice stops. Well, that's fantastic. And work. Yeah, that's that's a big a big jump, and that's uh, that's what we need to get those guns off the streets. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you, Chief. You bet. Steve, since you were talking about the uh, a corridor, uh, any updates on the no gridlock there going uh, southbound uh, at Vaughn's? Uh, unfortunately, I do not, but I will check and for for next meeting. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. And uh, before I give my comments real quick, the young lady here in the audience, she'd like to step up and talk for a few minutes. I don't have a name because she wants to remain anonymous. So. I don't hear anything. You don't hear? Is the microphone on? Can you hear me? Hang on, Car Carmen's going to come over. She's going to help you out. Okay. There you okay. go. There. Thank you. Can you hear me? Awesome. Good. Okay, I had an experience last week that uh, was most disconcerting, but it's. So, can you hear me with all the mask on? Yeah, okay. Um, and. I was watching an open house for a client, and um, these are not the best times for realtors and probably not the best times for police officers, but um, we certainly miss the Neighborhood Watch program down on Granada Street. We have a lot of people that drive down a street but they are stopped at certain houses, not them, but a car in front of them. And they don't really know what to do because nobody wants to be stopped or go around a car and um, in a very small street when somebody seems to be talking to somebody in the car with a paper bag in their hand, back and forth and back and forth to the houses. I lived on Granada for a long time. I feel like we're kind of the land of forgotten on the east side of Granada and the west side of Granada. But back to the open house. I had a client that was very interested to buy the house. Yay, yay, happy dance, happy dance. And by the time the client left, I called the client to see if we could make that contract. And the client said, oh, uh, yeah, no. And and I said, well, wait a second, we just had a conversation. Yeah, let's do this. And at the end of this, the day, she said, have you checked out your neighbors lately? What are you going to do for disclosures 
what are you going to say on the 640 disclosures that really have to be addressed for the neighbors and the house and where it is and what's going on here? Now, she was not a local realtor, and I kind of looked and went, uh, what did you see? I knew what she had seen. Um, there were some people close by uh, smoking crack on the weekends on the porch. We all know who they are, but when we report them, they're smoking crack. Yeah, it's all detective work, it's all quiet, but not much changes. 22 years, and I'd love to see us be able to have a neighborhood that feels like a working class neighborhood, that feels safe, but I don't know how to do it. So, that's it. Any questions, or no, I guess not? Well, we're not allowed to ask questions. Okay, that's so, it. But, okay. but I, I think Chief, you got Chief Shaw's attention, and that's always the important part of the public comments. So, yeah. so thank you, thank you. All right, uh, real quick for me, for the police department, just, uh, I like the new stat report, Chief. So you don't have to answer. I'm just telling you I like the new stat report there. And uh, I got a feeling that the stealth car that we're seeing out is now kind of the product of us having those CSOs, which is because that's what they do. They go out and they do those things, and we don't tie up an officer. So that's pretty good. So pretty happy there. All right. We'll move to item number four, fire department monthly report. I don't see the fire chief. So I assume they're, they're busy. Well, that's okay. Steve's, Steve's the chief is busy there, so we, we all got the fire report. I know that Kelsey sent it out, or Carmazai sent it out. Somebody sent us a fire report, so so we did get it. So it is on it is on record if you if you want to take a look at it. So so we'll just go ahead and we'll move on to the uh, last part of the agenda, the commissioner's reports. So anyone want to start? Okay, I'm right here. You want to start, Donna? Sure. Okay, thank you, Mike. <laughs> My question, oh, number one, I didn't get any reports. Can someone email them to me because I couldn't make it in this evening? I'd appreciate that. Yes? No? Okay. I'm sorry. Number they, they were sent out, Donna, so I, I know that I got them all. I got the agenda. The agenda was actually sent out like a week early. Uh, Kelsey was on it. So, so and then the fire well, report was I sent out today or yesterday? Well, I'll go I think it came it out today. Again. It came out this afternoon, the fire report. Well, I'll just go through it again. Okay. Anyway, my, my, other, my other comment is that the Public Safety Academy, what is happening with that? Is Eric Huber still involved? And we used to get a report from one of those, I don't know what you call them, cadets from the high school. Are we ever going to get those reports again? Or... You know they they do a fabulous job. I don't I don't know what happened. You know Donna, I, I Eric works for me at the college, and so I was uh -huh. talking to him about that. And uh, unfortunately, they don't have an explorer program anymore. No, currently. Oh. Yeah. So that and that was how that program worked. Is is one of the explorers would come and present. So for whatever reason, I'm not sure if that was a school decision or. Or what but they don't have an explorer post there anymore so that's why we lost um, that and Eric is still involved in the public safety uh, academy, academy program over there and uh, so they, they are still doing good work there and they do have a beautiful facility so did you want to add anything to that chief did I miss anything on that no that's exactly okay what I was gonna say. okay would would I still or a person still be allowed to go there and, and you know see what's going on you know just talk to them I, I think you'd have to call school? the school because I'm sure the school's limiting access due to COVID. Yeah, and I'll okay. reach I'll reach out to them and see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd call down to the school, Don, and see. Probably if you made an appointment, they'd probably let you let you do it with an appointment. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That, hmm. Other than that, I'm fine. I asked all my questions in between. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, Thank you. Go? Oh, sorry, Ken. You want to go next? Uh, just a quick reminder, um, 
Uh, it, w this is this being October 14th next week, October 21st. I was made aware that that is the it used to be called the Great American Shakeout, mm -hmm. and now it's International Shakeout Day re with uh, res regards to earthquake safety. It's got a wonderful website, shakeout.org forward slash California, and they go far more in depth than I'm probably going to be able to do in the remaining remainder of this meeting. But it goes into everything from, you know, drop and cover and how to take care of yourself within a, a building in an earthquake situation, uh, how to police your building, make sure that the, uh, you know, things like the gas is turned off and make sure that there are no falling hazards. It's a very comprehensive website. And apparently that's, uh, since it's gone international, they're expecting almost 24 million people worldwide to participate in it. It happens one week from today. It's October 21st. It's always the third Thursday in October, which I believe coincides with my own earthquake experience, the Loma Prieta earthquake that struck Northern California October 17, 1989. I was in an underground parking garage in San Francisco when it struck. What am I doing here? I can't answer that question, but uh, it's, yeah. it's certainly uh, relevant seeing that we're living in Desert Hot Springs and our good friend the San Andreas Fault is the creator of those beautiful mountains along the northern fringe of our city limits. So do take a look at the website, shakeout.org forward slash California, and you'll find some great information there, and uh, hopefully it will help you keep you safe. And that's all I've got. Awesome. That's great information. Did you information. say shake up or shake out? I can't. I Shakeout.org okay. forward slash California. Okay. It can be all lowercase. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, before okay. we, Lee, go ahead. Before we drop uh, the meeting, I just want to mention that tomorrow is uh, Police Officer's Day, believe it or not. You know, mm -hmm. Everybody has a day, but tomorrow is uh, our day. So put, the, put your flag out. And if you a policeman, stick your flag out there and be proud of it. So uh, we've done a good job. We'll leave it to these new guys. And uh, let's just celebrate it, okay? Yeah. Thank you, Lee. That was that was nice. So, Cliff, did you have anything? Yes. Some very sad news uh, this evening. Uh, when I moved to Desert Hot Springs, I actually purchased my first property, which I made my uh, primary residence. I had a vision for this city, and. I've seen a lot of good, a lot of bad, and I've tried my best to contribute to my community. Um, as you all know, my dad uh. has um, fallen again. Um, I was with him quite a bit, and when I came home last time, I put my house up for sale, and I've been able to sell it. So, at the end of this month, I will relinquish my responsibilities to this commission. Excuse me. I'm emotional because I really care about my community and I want to see it move forward and progress. You've all done a wonderful job. It's been a pleasure working and meeting each one of you. Uh, just because I won't be commissioner and won't be living here, I'm still going to keep my eyes on you guys. I'm going to watch the meetings. Steve, you'll be getting my phone calls. <laughs> I'll try to remember the time difference. <laughs> but I'm still going to, I still have a lot of love for this city. And I want the best for it. So I want to thank you all. I have called each one of the uh, council and mayor. And um, they understand. And uh, they all thank me for my efforts. And I hope that my efforts were... Uh, in the benefit, well, they were intended for the benefit of the city, and I know a lot of times uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, but 
my efforts were heartfelt because of my love for this city. And it's sad to, ha uh, to have to leave. So thank you all. God bless you, Cliff. I'll be praying for you and your dad. I covet all of your prayers. So thank you, Donna. Thank you. Much appreciated. Yeah, and I've had the honor and privilege of talking to Cliff's dad several times on the phone. <laughs> yeah. you, are, you are definitely making the right decision by going back there and taking care of that man because he is a treasure. <laughs> so, yeah, I, you know, Cliff, uh, we've sat up, this is our second time, go around together. And uh, I, I will say, uh, I don't, Christina wasn't here, but, but when Cliff and I first sat down up here on the podium together, your job was a nightmare and I I would definitely say one reason I mean a we've got really great people there now but one of the other reasons that it's it's really the uh, code code enforcement everything's really come up in the city is is because of Cliff's efforts he's been like a one man one man show and pushing that issue uh, yeah you know, each commissioner usually finds a an issue that they really like to push and uh, Cliff's passion has always been code enforcement so so Cliff when you do leave Okay, know that you have had an impact and a positive one, and you have left the city better than when you found it. So, and like I said, I, I wish you the best. I wish your dad the best, because uh, he definitely always sounds happy when you're sitting in the car with him. So I think it's a good thing that you're doing, so. When you come back, Cliff, I was really glad that you're coming back to our commission, because I was with you before, and you were gone, and, uh, you're, you really work hard at that code force, but that was your thing, just like, like he said, because you really, that, that's your baby. So I was so glad that you came back to our commission. So I'm going to really miss you. So I uh, wish you good luck with your father and everything. So hang in there. Yeah, it'll all work out good. So Ken, did you want to say something? Oh, absolutely. Well, I can call you Commissioner Levy because I haven't known you that long. Um, I can also call you Cliff because I met you when we first became acquainted with each other over at the, um, uh, the Rancho Del Oro community meetings held at the uh, Painted Hills Middle School. You know, I'm, <laughs> it would not surprise me at all that uh, I've been trying to resurrect those meetings over there. And maybe the reason that that hasn't come to fruition uh, other than COVID is because they know you're not gonna be over there. You know, because <laughs> the, you're like the good luck charm that we had. Um, and we, we've talked briefly about different matters in the city. Um, there's no doubt that you have a commitment to this city, that you know, that the city, you want to see it move forward. You want to see it um, move forward in a positive manner. And uh, I guess the best way for us to honor your service would be to take the flag and fly it the way you flew it and dedicate ourselves to the betterment of the city, the safety of its citizens, you know, the residents and the visitors may enjoy it as well, and um, not falter in that duty. And of course, it goes without saying, uh, we wish you the best with regards to taking care of your father. The fam family's always got to be first, you know, even in the fire service. That's, we all understood that, that family came first and everything. And um, uh, thoughts and prayers, you know, the wind be at your back and following seas. So good luck to you. Well said. And Donna, did you want to add something for Cliff? No, I just think I, it was a pleasure knowing you, Cliff, and I don't think this will be the end of at least talking or communicating. And you're doing the right thing. Life is short, and you're doing the right thing. And I'll be praying for you and your dad all the time. So thank you very much. Thank each one of you for your kind thoughts. Much appreciated. Thank you all. All right. Well, I guess we'll be getting a new commissioner then, huh? Are you going to have some input, I hope? I've already put a couple of suggestions okay. in. <laughs> <laughs> See, you're still working it. <laughs> Thank you, Cliff. All right, just uh, oh, you're not done with me yet. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get on Zoom, and I'm gonna tell Kelsey make sure that I'm on Zoom, and I'm gonna be making my comments and still directing. He was always calling me at home. Yeah, that's the way it works. So, all right, let's uh, 
Uh, for my for my portion, the only thing I have is, uh, uh, Carmen Zach, can we please add a, a agenda item for next month's meeting? And I'd like to see if we can get an update on where we're at with the uh, new fire contract. So I, I, well, this was something that we, we talked about in December. We, we mentioned it in January. The commission came in on February and we created our subcommission and they kicked butt for like two months and we got told that there was going to be something happening and then it's been like five, six months since we've been told that. So I'd, I'd kind of like to see if we can get an update. I understand negotiations could still be in effect, but it'd be nice if we could kind of get an update as to what's going on with that project because that was our project for the year mm -hmm. and the year is almost up and I'd, I'd like to see that, you know, sometimes people say we don't accomplish much. I think that's not correct, and but it's it would be nice to have this project in our pocket and done. So, so any, anybody got any issues with that being put on the? No, not at all. Um, I know that there was supposed to be a presentation made on the part of Cal Fire Riverside County Fire to the City Council sometime in the fourth quarter, mm -hmm. and I've been. You know, keeping a close eye yeah. on the agendas to see when that presentation was going to be. I was notified that, you know, Donna and myself were going to be notified when that meeting was so that we could attend. Good. And actually find out at that time where, you know, what the plans were, where they stood and everything. To date, we have not received that notification. Okay. Um, I, do have, I do have some, uh, some questions myself that I would like to be answered. And between now and the next meeting, I will be contacting personnel from... Riverside County Fire and asking them uh, specific questions about where they're going and I you know I've, I've spoken to Commissioner Lozano about a tour of our local fire stations you know I've also s s talked about um, viewing a specific apparatus I think the closest one that they have that I'm interested in is in Lake Elsinore mm -hmm. and uh, just for our own edification to see where they're going with this but um, right. we're gonna we'll try and stay on top of it and get as much yeah. information but as that we project can. belongs to you and, and Donna and just to avoid Brown Act violations we don't talk about it so so uh, but yeah if we could get that thrown on the agenda I think the rest of the commissioners we'd be pretty happy I'm sure Cliff will be watching on zoom to make sure we don't mess that up so if we do, he'll call me, I'm sure, and tell me I'm messing it up. So. <laughs> Did you want that as a motion for? No, I, as, as chairperson, I can put it on there. I just wanted to make sure that, that we didn't have any issues, anybody had any other issues, or maybe somebody knew something I didn't know and said, uh, we don't need that, just shut up and move, move on. But, but I didn't hear that, so I think we should probably get an update, okay? All right. Anything else for the good of the order? No, then I'd like to thank the lady who came in and spoke. I'd like to thank Luz for coming in from Mosquito Vector because that was great information. I'd like to thank Ted Meyerhofer for coming in and helping brief us up with some stuff. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.